Boats Sail on the Rivers by Christina Rossetti Boats sail on the rivers and ships sail on the seas but clouds that sail across the sky are prettier far than these. There are bridges on the rivers as pretty as you please but the bow that bridges heaven and overtops the trees and builds a road from earth to sky is prettier far than these. The End Indian Children by Annette Wynne Where we walk to school each day, Indian children used to play all about our native land where the shops and houses stand. And the trees were very tall and there were no streets at all, not a church and not a steeple, only woods and Indian people, only wigwams on the ground and at night bears prowling round. What a different place today, where we live and work and play. The End Roadways by John Maysfield One road leads to London, one road leads to Wales. My road leads me seawards to the white dipping sails. One road leads to the river as it goes singing slow. My road leads to shipping where the bronzed sailors go leads me, lures me, calls me to salt green tossing sea. A road without earth's road dust is the right road for me. A wet road, heaving, shining, and wild with seagulls' cries. A mad salt sea wind blowing the salt spray in my eyes. My road calls me, lures me, west, east, south, and north. Most roads lead men homewards, my road leads me forth to add more miles to the tally of grey miles left behind in quest of that one beauty God put me here to find. The End Here's the first chapter of the book At the Little Brown House by Ruth Alberta Brown. Chapter 1 A Morning Caller it was a glorious morning in early June. The dew still hung heavy on each grass blade and leaf, making rainbow tapestries that defy description, as the waking sunbeams stole into the heart of each round drop and nestled there. The fresh, cool air was sweet with the breath of a thousand flowers. A beautiful bird chorus filled the earth with riotous melody as the happy-hearted songsters flitted from tree to tree, saying, Good morning to their neighbors. Through a mass of rosy clouds in the east, the sun struggled up over the hilltop and smiled down on the sleeping village of Parker, as if trying to coax the dreamers to arise and behold the beauties of the dawning day. In the barnyards of the little farms scattered around about the town, roosters were crowing, hens were clucking, cattle lowing, and horses stamping and neighing, eager for their breakfast. Old Towser, from his bed on the porch of the little brown house, almost hidden by tall maples and wide-spreading elms, stretched and yawned, perked up his ears, listened intently, then rose stiffly, shook his heavy coat, and, leisurely descending the steps, circled around the place to see whether anyone was yet astir. The door slammed at the greenhouse on the farm adjoining, from the little red cottage across the fields came the sound of a busy axe, and down by the creek some early riser whistled merrily as he went about his morning work. All this old Towser heard, and strolling back to his place on the porch, he looked up at the chamber window above him and barked sharply. The drawn curtain flew up with a flirt. A small tousled head appeared behind the screen, and a childish voice in a loud whisper commanded, "'Keep still, you old Towser! It isn't time to wake Gail yet! We've got to get those flowers, then she wouldn't let us if she knew!' A second small face joined the first at the window, followed by still another, all blinking sleepily but eager with excitement. "'Oh, peace!' whispered the oldest of the trio in an awestruck voice. "'Isn't it a beautiful day?' I've a notion to call. Don't you dast, quickly interposed the first speaker. You know Gail had never let us go. Just see how wet everything is. Did it rain? asked the third child, the youngest of them all, critically examining the trees and porch roof, and then lifting her great blue eyes to the blue sky above as if expecting to see her answer there. No, Goosey, it's just you, but it must have been awful heavy. Get your clothes on, Allie, or Gail will wake before we are started. Aren't you ready, Cherry? Most, 
came the muffled reply from the corner where a struggling tangle of clothes, hands and feet proclaimed that Cherry was hurrying. Then come on, we'll have to fly. I'll button your dress when we get outside, Ally. Never mind your other shoe, Cherry. You can put it on downstairs. Have you got your basket? Giving her directions in sharp, imperative whispers, Peace led the way into the hall, leaped onto the banisters, boy fashion, and slid quickly and quietly to the floor below, where she waited in a fever of impatience for her less daring sisters to creep backward down the creaking stairs. Skip that one. It squeaks like fury. Oh, Ally, what a racket. There, I knew you'd do it. Gail's awake. Shh, girls. They held their breath, huddled close in the darkest corner of the hall, and waited. Peace? Again came the call from above. A happy inspiration seized the small culprit, and she snored vigorously. Cherry and Ally clapped both hands over their mouths to stifle their giggles, but Gail was evidently satisfied, for she did not repeat her summons and after another moment of hushed waiting, the half-dressed, disheveled trio tiptoed down the hall, cautiously unlocked the kitchen door, and slipped out into the sweet freshness of the early day. There was a quick scampering of little feet down the walk, a subdued click of the gate, and the three children, holding hands, raced madly along the dusty road until a thick hedge of sumac and hazel bushes hid them from the little brown house. Then Peace slackened her gait somewhat, but did not cease running, and kept looking behind her as if still fearing pursuit or discovery. "'Oh, Peace!' gasped Allie at last, stumbling blindly over sticks and stones as her older sisters dragged her along between them. "'My dress is coming off, and my breath is all in chunks. Do we have to run the whole way?' Peace looked back at the small perspiring figure, saw the plump shoulders from which the unbuttoned dress had slipped, caught a glimpse of flying shoestrings, rumpled stockings, and naked legs, as the little feet were jerked unceremoniously over humps and hollows of the rough roadway, and stopped so abruptly that her companions were thrown headlong into the dust, creating such a commotion that a weary slumberer on the opposite side of the thicket was rudely startled out of his nap, thinking some great catastrophe had overtaken him. As he sat up and rubbed his eyes, looking around him in bewilderment for the cause of his sudden awakening, he heard an angry voice sputter shrilly, "'Well, peace, Greenfield, I must say—' "'Don't stop to say it now,' interrupted another childish voice. "'I never meant to dump you over like that. You shouldn't have been running so fast. Supposing you had been a train and tumbled into the ditch, I reckon all your passengers would have got a good jolt. I stopped so's we could finish dressing. Cherry, where's your other shoe? You have run all the way down the road with only one on. Just look at your stocking.' "'Where's yours? You haven't any stockings at all,' retorted the first voice, still sharp with indignation." "'In my pocket. I was afraid Gail would hear us for we got gone. "'There, Allie, your dress is done. Fasten up your shoes while I put on my stockings. "'We'll have to hurry, cause I don't think Gail will go back to sleep again.' "'There was a subdued rustling for a moment or two beyond the dense hedge, "'and then the listening man heard the sound of hurrying footsteps in the road, "'and the children vanished without his having caught a glimpse of them. "'But he was now thoroughly awake.' and as soon as the steps died away in the distance, he rose from his bed among the leaves, shook out his grey blankets, rolled and strapped them into a bundle, threw them under the overhanging shrubbery, and slowly made his way through the trees to a wide, sparkling creek, whose tumbling waters made sweet music in the woods. "'What a glorious scene this is!' he murmured aloud, gazing in rapt admiration at the wooded hills, the singing stream, the bright flowers." Why can't we be content to live in such places, instead of building great, smoky, sooty cities? You little creek, you sang me to sleep last night. Wish I could take you back home with me. What a pretty flower! Little bird, you will split your throat if you try to pour out all your melody at once. Better give us a little at a time. Of course you are happy. Who wouldn't be on such a wonderful day? Oh, what sentiments for a tramp! "'Campbell, have you forgotten what you are?' He was near the road now, and suddenly a baby voice piped shrilly. "'Yes, here is the bridge, and there is the sun. Oh, just look at the sun. It's way up high now. Ain't it big and fiery?' "'Supposing it was a frying pan,' spoke up a second voice, which the startled tramp recognized as belonging to peace. "'And we could have all the buckwheat cakes it could cook. My, wouldn't that be nice?' 
they came slowly into view through the shrubbery, three strange dripping little figures with hair flying, dresses wet and rumbled, shoes soaked and muddy, but literally loaded down with masses of late columbine and sweet wood violets. And they made a pretty picture with their bright rosy faces and excited sparkling eyes. The tramp in the shadow of the trees caught his breath, then laughed to himself at Peace's supposition and Cherry's horrified exclamation, "'Why, Peace Greenfield, whatever put such a crazy idea into your head? Supposing the sun was a frying pan?' "'I just think it would make a good one, and I believe the cakes would be dandy, too. Mmm, I can smell them now. I'm starving hungry, and it does take so long for the girls to cook pancakes in our little frying pan. Hurry up, it must be breakfast time already. I wish I had wings to fly home with. Supposing we were birds, we would be there in a jiffy. "'Let's play we were,' suggested Allie. "'That will make the way seem shorter.' All right, the sisters assented, and with their great bouquets flapping wildly in the wind, the trio sped swiftly out of sight up the road, leaving the tramp again to his thoughts. Pancakes makes me hungry, too. Guess I'd better wash and be moving on in search of a breakfast. I wonder if those youngsters live near here. He knelt beside the clear stream and ducked his head again and again in the cool water finally drying his face on a clean handkerchief and running his fingers through his bushy grey hair in place of a comb. His toilet done, he set out briskly down the road the children had taken, whistling under his breath and keeping a careful lookout for farmhouses on the way. At the first place he approached, the watchful housewife had loosed a vicious-looking bulldog and the tramp wisely passed by without stopping. The next house was deserted, the door of the third was slammed in his face before he could even make known his wants, and he was beginning to wonder if he must go breakfastless, when a sharp, childish treble rang out clearly on the still morning air. The Campbells are coming, oh ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. the Campbells are coming, oh ho, oh, oh, ho. Oh. So sudden was the discordant burst of song, and so close by, that the tramp stopped in his tracks and stared in the direction of the voice. Well, of all things... That announcement quite took my breath away, he exclaimed, hurrying forward once more. The voice sounds like supposing peace. I wonder if it can be she. It was indeed. Another rod and he found himself in front of a gate, on the high post of which was perched a diminutive bare-legged girl in a soiled damp frock, superintending the drying of three pair of mud-covered shoes arranged in a row on a picket fence, while she issued orders to the two sisters sitting in the middle of the gravel walk, busily sorting flowers. "'As true as you live, I don't suppose these shoes will ever be dry by school time. Supposing we have to go barefooted, and this is the last day of the term!' "'Cherry, you've got too many columbines in that horn. "'They look pinched. Put some in Allie's boat.' "'Allie's boat? "'Well, she is fixing it for Miss Truesdale, "'even if she ain't a sure enough scholar yet. "'Don't make such little stingy bunches of violets. "'We picked plenty. "'I can't coax your toes to shine, Cherry. "'I'm scared that the blacking won't do any good. "'You shouldn't have worn your best ones.' "'I haven't any others. "'My old pair is all worn out. "'And why? Who?' Cherry had caught sight of the shabby figure at the gate, but before she could finish her sentence, Peace, following the direction of her eyes, wheeled about on her perch, surveyed the man with big, almost sombre brown eyes, and poured forth an avalanche of questions. "'Are you a tramp? Do you want some work? Or are you just begging? Can you chop wood? Do you know how to hoe? Are you hungry?' "'Yes, miss, I'm hungry,' the tramp managed to stammer. "'Could you give me a bite to eat?' "'Not unless you will work for it.' was the firm reply. We don't believe in feeding beggars, but we're always glad to help the deserving poor. The man's shrewd, deep-set eyes twinkled with amusement at her grown-up tone and manner, but he answered with seeming meekness, I will be only too glad to do anything I can for a breakfast. There's wood to be chopped. Gale ain't strong enough to do such work, and our man is lazy. Reckon we'll let him go as soon as the garden is in shape. There's a heap of vines to be trained up on strings round the porches, and there are all the flower beds to be weeded. This grass needs cutting, and the roof of the head house has to be fixed so as it won't leak. The hoop has come off the rain barrel, and the back step is broken, and... Oh, yes, there are three screens that we can't get on the windows, and Mike never finds time for them. Peace. Stop for a breath and the tramp took advantage of the pause to say, "'Which one of those jobs will you have me do?' "'Which one?' echoed the child in round-eyed amazement. "'Why, all of them!
of them, of course. You don't expect us to give you breakfast unless you do something to earn it, do you? After I've told you we never feed beggars? No, miss, I am willing to work, but you better find out what your ma wants me to do first so I can begin. Mama's an invalid, Peace answered promptly, but I will ask Gail, she will know, and besides, she is cook here. She leaped nimbly to the ground and disappeared within doors, where some sort of an argument evidently waged warm and furious for a time, judging from the sound of voices heard in the garden. Finally, Peace put in appearance again, not the jaunty, self-reliant young lady who had interviewed the tramp a few moments before, but a very sober-faced, dejected-looking child who twisted her dress into knots with nervous fingers and at length stammered in embarrassed tones, "'Gail says you can have some breakfast if you will split a little wood for her first, but she says it's an imposition to expect you to do all I said you should. I don't see why. There's a heap of work around here to be done and no one but Mike to do it.' "'There! Faith told me not to say anything about not having any men on the place. "'Mike is only a boy, you know, and he doesn't belong here. "'We haven't got any—' "'Peace, Greenfield!' "'The voice was sharp with exasperation, and Peace retired hastily indoors once more, "'calling back over her shoulder. "'You'll find the axe by the woodpile if Mike hasn't got it in the meadow "'or it isn't in the shed or the barn. "'I'll come out and tell you when to quit. "'Yes, Faith, I am hurrying. "'Be sure you cut lots, cause—' "'The voice trailed away into indistinctness.' and the tramp, with a smile on his face, went to hunt up the missing axe, and soon sharp, ringing blows told the occupants of the house that he was hard at work. Rapidly the huge pile of heavy knots diminished in size, and just as rapidly the heap of split stove-wood grew, while the perspiration rolled in great beads down the worker's crimson face. At last he paused a moment to rest his back and wipe the moisture from his hot forehead, and as he drew his handkerchief down from his eyes, he saw Peace standing before him, holding a platter in her extended arms, while she surveyed the result of his labour with approving eyes. "'You've done splendid!' she breathed enthusiastically. "'The last tramp who cut wood for us piled it up so it looked like there was an awful lot, but after he was gone we found he had heaped it around a big hole in the middle and there wasn't hardly any split!' Faith said she was sure you would do the same way, but I watched you from the window while Cherry and me were washing the dishes, and you never tried to hide a hole in the middle at all. Here is your breakfast. Gail cooked it, else you wouldn't have got much. It's Faith's turn to get the meals today, but she is baking a cake for the minister's reception tonight and is crosser in two sticks, so Gail fixed it. You see, we were all through breakfast when you got here, or you might have had more. I don't know, though. Faith says if she had her way about it, she'd send every single tramp who comes here marching down the street with the enemy in pursuit. That means Towser, but he wouldn't bite anyone. Faith is cross every time she makes a cake. You might have eaten in the kitchen if it hadn't been for that. She sends us all outdoors when she's baking so as we won't make her cakes fall. She does make fine things, though. Mmm, they are good. Never mind, the kitchen is hot anyway. But it's nice and cool out here under this maple. This is my maple. Papa built that bench for me and Ally before he went to heaven. You can sit on the ground and play the seat was your table, or you can sit in the seat and hold this platter in your lap. Which'll you do? The tramp smiled broadly, relieved the small maid of her heavy load, and dropped wearily onto the wide bench, saying gratefully, "'This will do nicely. Thank you. What a fine breakfast you have brought me. Gail must be a good cook. Is she your sister?' As he spoke, he picked up an egg and carefully broke it on the edge of his plate. "'Yes, Gail's the oldest of us. Oh, Mr. Tramp, just see what you have done!' I was afraid Gail hadn't given you breakfast enough and that you might get hungry before noon, so when she wasn't looking I put on a whole lot of extra toast and four eggs and some matches to cook them with, and you've gone and smashed a raw egg all over everything. He stared in dismay at the broken yolk streaming over his cream potatoes, and then seeing the consternation in the big brown eyes of his small hostess, he laughed heartily and said, Never mind, little girl, I am hungry enough for even raw eggs this morning. Doctors often make their patients eat such things. Here goes. Peace watched him in silence for a moment, and then observed, You don't look like any tramps we ever had here before. They always shovel in their food with their knives, but you use your fork. You can work, too. Why don't you get a job somewhere and earn some money instead of loafing around begging for your meals? The man paused, with his fork halfway to his mouth, surprised at the child's keen observations. Then he answered lightly, I do sometimes, but a feller can't work all the time, can he? Well, most folks have to, though I never could see why they all can't have vacations like we do at school. This is our last day until next fall. 
Is that what you children gathered the flowers for? Yes, and for the minister's reception tonight. We went early this morning for the rest of the folks were up, and oh me, but didn't Faith scold when we got back? She said we ought all of us to be whipped and sent to bed. Faith is real ugly when she's making cakes. We did get awfully wet. I had no notion it would be so bad. But we got the flowers anyway, and we made some baskets yesterday out of birch bark and moss. Here comes Allie with them now. She doesn't go to school yet, but sometimes she visits with Cherry and me, and today is one of those times. Ain't the baskets pretty? Scrumptious, was the admiring answer as the man clumsily lifted one of the dainty boats filled with dog-tooth violets and drank in its perfume with the delight of a child. What wouldn't city people give for these little nosegays from the woods? They would go like hotcakes. What do you mean? asked mystified Peace, failing to understand what connection her beloved flowers could have with hotcakes. Why, in big cities, at almost any of the important business corners, you will see little boys and girls selling sweet peas and daisies, and, yes, they sometimes sell cowslips and wood violets, but only in bunches, never in such cunning little baskets. Why, tucked down in that damp moss, your flowers will keep fresh for hours, while a whole bunch from a city flower seller's stock withers as soon as it is taken out of the water. Would folks in Martindale buy them? Yes, indeed, they're a breath from the woods, and lots of people would be glad to get them. You see... Peace, Greenfield! It's time to start! Do you want to be late, the last day of school? That's Cherry. I must go. I wish I could stop and talk some more. When you finish your breakfast, just take the dishes around to the kitchen steps, and if you have time and want to do it, you might weed those flower gardens in the front yard and the onion patch behind the shed. If you don't, I'll have to. And you remember, I gave you some extra lunch that you wouldn't have got if it hadn't been for me. And a few matches. Promise you won't light a fire till you get a long way from our house, will you? Gail won't give tramps matches for fear they will set the buildings on fire. And say, the lawnmower is right beside the front porch. If you should happen to want to cut the grass, just the little piece fenced in, you know. The rest is for hay. And the ball of twine for stringing up Hope's vines is stuck in the hole of the porch railing nearest the door. You can find it easy enough. The rain barrel is behind the house and... Yes, yes, Cherry, I'm coming this very minute. I hope you have liked your nice breakfast and will come again some other time and split more wood for us. Goodbye, Mr. Tramp. I've got to go.